Phones are open at 011-542-2186, or you can join us on social media. In studio is Dr. Dial and Dima, UNISA constitutional law expert. And uh, we also have Mafim Gobozi, uh, the uh, South African Defense Force spokesperson on the phone line, and Dr. Jackie Saliers from the Institute for Security Studies as their executive director joining us via Sky uh, Skype. And Helmand Heitman, a military analyst, is also on the phone. Good evening to you, Doc, and thank you so much, Doc, for your time. Let's just look at the Constitution and what it says, especially with the Defence Force, and uh, the, the Act and their interaction with community members in the event of crime. Um, yes, the, the Constitution in Section 200 allows the President to deploy the army uh, to uh, fight crime. Uh, something that happens in exceptional circumstances. It's not something that you can do all the time. That is clear from the, uh, from the words of the uh, Defense Act, which has set out uh, the circumstances in which he can do that. Particularly the circumscribed nature of doing that, that he must do it in such a way that as soon as he has done that, he must report it to Parliament and Parliament must review what he has done, checking the circumstances if they were actually the correct ones for doing it. Mm. Because it is not something that he may always do. All right, let's get Dr. Jackie Salia, who joins us via Skype from the Institute for Security Studies. Dr. Salia, the prerequisites of having to deploy the army, and especially as Dr. Ndima was saying, constitutionally, it's the president that appoints or deploys the army under very strict, severe circumstances, and there are certain procedures to be followed. Do you think that this approach by the minister is correct? Yes, I think for a limited uh, time period, the uh, what we're seeing here is quite a serious failure of normal policing and the, the military can come in, but it can only come in for a short period of time and it provides additional boosts on the ground. But this is not going to resolve the challenges that we see in the Western Cape. Uh, those challenges will only be resolved with a uh, comprehensive a policing approach that includes um, detective work and, um, and the establishment of normal policing um, within the Western Cape, and that is not happening. I think uh, recently in the um, police annual report of 2016-2017 that the Minister of Policing tabled, he set out the challenges that uh, SAPS faces, and it is really quite a daunting list. And it is because of those failures of uh, uh, oversight, um, the lack of uh, an effective crime intelligence unit and um, misalignment that we are in the, uh, in this situation. So yes, we can bring the military in. It may help in the short term, but this is not going to in the um, this is not this is not a solution to the challenges that we face in places like Mitchell's Plain and so on. And Dr. Salia, while we're on that, though, if you're saying that we're dealing with the symptoms and not necessarily the root causes, that of socioeconomic challenges, uh, the access to substance abuse, unemployment, etc., uh, what, what strategy then would work? Because one minister after another would come in with their kind of hardened stance uh, to convince the public of their ability to keep us safe. And, and yet you're saying that uh, it's not necessarily the right approach. No, I think that the right approach, what the police need is, is stability uh, amongst uh, all others. One of the reasons that the police are not effective is because of the turbulence and the appointment uh, cadre deployment within the police and um, the uh, misalignment that occurred really going back to um, the commission of police, Jackie Selebe, and the disbandment of a number of specialized units. The police have not been able to recover from that. And um, it has, for example, a crime in intelligence unit and a uh, detective's uh, uh, unit that is completely understaffed. All the specialized units have been um, uh, <coughs> disbanded. Um, expenditure is, uh, you have an extremely large police force uh, with very limited, uh, that spends 79% of its budget on salaries and very little really on um, uh, capital equipment and so on and so forth. So if we can fix the police, if we can fix how the police operates, we will immediately, I think, see significant improvements in what is happening in, in the Western Cape and in Gauteng.
Mm. All right, please stay on the line. Helmut uh, Heitman is a military analyst joining us on the line. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, is the SANDF uh, trained adequately to deal with issues of policing, primarily when it comes to apprehending uh, uh, criminals uh, without using excessive force? Uh, I believe Helmut is not with us at the moment. Uh, we, we, yeah, all right, we do have a problem with our lines. Mr. Uh, Dr. Ndima, you, maybe you can take that one. In terms of the prescribed training that each arm um, of the military or even the security cluster would have to have and whether the SANDF fits that particular uh, profile? Um, in general, the soldiers are not trained to fight crime. Their duty is to protect the republic um, and its people. They are aimed at outside invasion, not internally. They cannot deal with uh, civilians. Um, according to the Act, they need to have a training to deal with uh, uh, deployment in police duties like they do. Um, uh, the Act actually requires them to, 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 to have training for that. They cannot just be put in the township or somewhere without any clue uh, to what. But they don't have the training of the police for dealing with crime. Because they, uh, in the Act as well, their duties are limited. If they find anything like arresting a person or uh, seizing some goods, they must immediately hand over to the police. And uh, also, whatever they do in crime fighting, they must not investigate crime. It's not their duties. Therefore, they are not normally the people who should be dealing with civilians. Mm. And you're saying that the current increase or rise in violent crime it does not uh, justify the deployment of the SANDF, albeit temporarily? I think it does. Yes. Once there is violence with which police cannot cope, because you must know that the SADF, uh, uh, SANDF, uh, one of its uh, mandates is to protect the public. The public includes the police. If, therefore, the situation is such that uh, anybody is not safe, including the police. They must be there to cover the police so that the police can do their job. All right, we take calls on 011-542-2186. Rajan and Guazulu Natal, good evening to you. Uh, what is your comment or question? Hi, Rajan. Hi, ma'am. Uh, yes, thank you uh, for accepting my call as uh, calls before this. Uh, Minister of Port became Minister of Police. He just came there one, two days, three days, uh, week, he said there's a new sheriff in town. And mm. he only came there to remove the the, uh, the Hawks boss. <laughs> okay, I will give his name. The ex, right. I will arrest him and this uh, and that. And and suddenly, amazing, he's yeah? calling for, suddenly he's calling for the army. Within a few months. Is this uh, acceptable or not? All right, we'll put that to our experts, but what do you do in such severe cases, uh, Raja, uh, in that, you know, you have these other levers of uh, the uh, security cluster that can assist. It's not necessarily taking over the police function, but we'll ask our panelists. Uh, Fanny in Bloemfontein, good evening to you. Good evening, how are you? I'm very well, how are you? Fine, fine. Mm. What's your question or comment, Fanny? Okay, so my comment it was like, uh, you know, the issue about uh, uh, taking arm in uh, fighting crime, yes, it's a good idea. But uh, as the doctor was saying, it's for a short period of time. Mm. Uh, the police, what they have to do first before they start uh, using force and in, in, uh, these systems of force in, uh, in fighting crime, what they have to do is to have uh, the public confidence. You know, if they have a public confidence, they can easily get crime because these crime, these criminals, they are there in the public. There are some people who are staying with them, but they are not enjoying staying with them. Yeah. You Funny, thanks so, so much. Yeah, I think the point you're making is that, you know, there's a trust deficit and that even communities are reluctant to, uh, to be vigilant and report crime because the perpetrators end up being back on the streets anyway. But thanks so much uh, for, your, for your call. We go to Mafi um, Gomezolo, or, or rather Mkobozi, uh, the South African National Defence Force uh, spokesperson. Good evening to you, Mr Mkobozi, and uh, thanks for your time. Do you have any idea uh, as to how this plan will, will be rolled out in terms of the deployment of the army? 
Hi, Mr. Mkopozi. All right, uh, we do have gremlins in the system. Let's check if uh, Dr. Salias is still with us. And uh, the prescription again in how to roll this out in, in, in the, the number of uh, deployed members of the, the army, what are they meant to do, you know, what kind of crimes are they supposed to investigate. That, is, uh, oh, that detail is devoid uh, from the strategy we've heard or the statement from the minister. Yes, I, I haven't seen the exact numbers that are under that are under discussion, but certainly um, I would concur with the fact that the um, SNDF probably needs some preparatory training before they can be deployed. At the moment, they are still engaged in the DR Congo and elsewhere, so uh, it's not like the SNDF has significant resources uh, to be able to support the police. The police is a much larger force um, with a much larger budget. Its budget is something like three times the size of the SNDF, and the SNDF is really struggling. Um, it is struggling at operational level. Um, it is in a, in a really in a bad shape. Uh, the uh, department is not managing to get um, funding to uh, implement the defense review. So uh, yes, they have some personnel that probably can be deployed for a short period of time to support uh, numbers to do roadblocks and so on and so forth. Um, and that may bring some temporarily calm stability into the Western Cape. But uh, this will probably be for a limited period of time and as we've been saying this is not a solution we need to fix the policing we need to f fix uh, schools and these kind of issues and that will certainly help to to deal with the scourge of, of violent crime that we see uh, the, the the military can help but it's uh, but it's not the solution Mm. Let's talk about the intelligence and the ability to gather uh, information, especially when it comes to organized crime on the part of the policing, which could be a problem if, if they don't have the capacity, uh, Dr. Ndima. I mean, best practices internationally, but not that we are unique in, in, in the sense of high crime levels. But what can we learn from our counterparts when it comes to just intelligence around dealing with the issue of especially organized crime? Yes, um, the police always have to have intelligence in order to combat crime. Um, all crime, not only organized crime. Uh, you, you'll find that police, uh, whenever they go to an area, they always know who their people are, who to touch to get the information. Therefore, that is uh, not only a South African thing. Uh, everywhere where there is serious policing, there is intelligence. Um, I don't know the situation now because there are also accusations that police themselves connive with criminals in South Africa. Um, some of them even sell weapons to the criminals. Therefore, it, the damage that is there, it may be self-inflicting as well mm. because there's evidence. Yeah. Instances. And, and, and there's not only about the allegations around corruption, but, you know, we've seen examples at least uh, where action was taken uh, where members of uh, some members of the police had uh, serving jail time for whatever uh, form of crime that they were engaged in. Mm -hmm. But there's a question and Dr. Salia and uh, to you, Dr. Ndema, on the consistency, you know, taking one minister. Uh, ser serving one term and then deploying him to a completely different portfolio than what he had been accustomed to. What impact does that have on the stability, especially in policing? Dr. Salia, we'll start with you. Hello, Dr. Salia. Uh, I see. I think that's a huge problem. I think we've seen um, consistent instability and political interference in the top echelons of the of the police. And uh, you were previously speaking about the the challenges in in um, in uh, crime intelligence. And I'll just read to you from the report that the minister tabled, I think, uh, today or yesterday, where he says that um, having stated a policy objective that crime fighting will be intelligence led. There are staffing and technological inadequacies in the Division of Crime Intelligence, which has rendered the function non-responsive. And then, uh, so we have a, a, a police that is blind. It does not have adequate intelligence, and no wonder that it cannot deal with crime, and that we then wish to bring in the SANDF, which will put boots on the ground, but it, uh, it will be a temporary measure. Uh, and uh, we need to go back to fixing the basics in the police. That means bringing stability and professionalism in the police. And the most important requirement there is the appointment of police professionals uh, to manage the police, the appointment of a national police commissioner and stability in the policing. There, there, there are many, many challenges within that uh, that, that can really help, I think, uh, much that will do, go much further 
um, than uh, the deployment of the SANDF. SANDF may help in the short term. All right, Dr. Salia, stay on the line. We have uh, Police Minister Figil Mbalula joining us on the line. And good evening to you, and thanks so much for your time. Really a lot more questions around the detail of what the SANDF is meant to do and how long uh, this uh, intervention is going to last. The Wanya Tzotzi is the last campaign you spoke about, and now you're seeking help from the SANDF. Is this your own admission that uh, perhaps that strategy wasn't working? No, it is, it is working very well. Uh, no, it is working, it is working very well. Uh, what I want SANDF for, it is in the specific areas in Gauteng and in particular in the Western Cape, uh, in the Cape Flats, where we deal with combative uh, methods in the fight against crime. And I think uh, SANDF as a multiplier on the ground will help us. And when we release our resources to also uh, concentrate on other areas. So uh, the SANDF intervention does not mean that everything else has failed. We are succeeding, we are doing very well, and I'm not looking at ad hoc mechanism. I'm looking at eradicating these dangerous criminals amongst our people. Uh, many weapons, you know, there's a lot of guns. We must raid them, get those guns and all of that. So the army will go a long way to assist us. All right, but uh, this is obviously a temporary intervention. There are other uh, perennial problems within the police, as we heard from our panelists. The stability when it comes to leadership, number one. The lack of capacity. Uh, Dr. Salia saying that essentially the police is blind and don't have uh, the, the necessary intelligence to even identify or the threat uh, when it comes to crime. Uh, Cindy, you may say that is something of the past. Uh, my main focus, as you would have known from my budget vote, I said my approach is crime intelligence led. And with all the concerns that have been raised about crime intelligence, I've laid my hands. I've gone to crime intelligence, I'm restructuring, and at the same time, I'm responding in relation to making and sharpening our crime intelligence uh, machine. And uh, I think uh, you will see the results in the next coming months in relation to the work I've put into crime intelligence, uh, giving them directives, them responding to that, sorting out issues of management at a macro-political level, including in the provinces, that will yield the results. I'm the first one to admit that crime intelligence was our challenge. But uh, with us now attending to the issues and not lamenting, it is fine for others to do, but I'm the minister, I must lead. And if I say crime intelligence must lead, and it is my approach, I must give support, I must ensure that that machinery is well sharpened. I've just finished a meeting now with the general, uh, both Mapoloba, which is general Nobo of the acting crime intelligence, and general Motiva, to look at the directives that I've given to crime intelligence to put them to effect. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite on duty and hard at work in terms of uh, making it a point that we change the face of the police and make crime intelligence work. All right, I just want to quote uh, Dr. Ndeba, I'll paraphrase what he said. He's a UNISA constitutional expert, uh, constitutional law expert uh, who is in studio with us, that the army is not trained to deal with policing issues and there is a great possibility of the violation of the Police Act in how uh, police or SA, the SANDF in this case would interact uh, with criminals or communities and possibly violate that training of not using excessive force, for example? No, the army will be deployed uh, strategically. The police will still be in the front line uh, because we arrest. So we use the army as a multiplier, particularly in attacking dangerous criminals who are well armed. I was here in Cape Town since from last week. We're in Maragana, day in and day out, working with the police, arresting dangerous criminals, searching their houses, harassing them and getting most of them behind the bars. From Marikana, Philippi to Hanover Park, police are hard at work. We've doubled our numbers on the ground. But with the army as the multiplier, it's not everywhere where the army will be there closing shippings, doing anything of that sort. That will still fall within policing. The army will be there as a multiplier to deal with combative uh, combative and at the same time dangerous criminals. So 
There is nothing like uh, there's going to be confusion of roles on the ground. It will never arise. And uh, they will be strategically deployed. Now, we have asked, and the president, before he could even release the army, he will have to know where they will be deployed in terms of the hotspots. Minister, please just stay on the line. We take uh, last comments uh, or closing remarks or qu questions even from our panelists. I'll start in studio with Dr. Ndima. Um, the law allows the deployment of the army in crime fighting. Um, it, as I said, it happens only in exceptional circumstances. The, those circumstances must exist because the deployment is going to be checked by parliament and it can be cancelled. Um, therefore, it is something that it does not always happen. It is, not something that, it is something that is also not desirable because the police uh, uh, may feel uh, sidelined by the presence of the army because the people now start looking up to the army, not up to the police. Mm. Therefore, it has got a confidence problem. All right, there are pros and cons, Minister, in any system. I just want to get a reaction from Dr. Salia in, in, in your assertion that, uh, that, that it's a deep-rooted problem and uh, that is quite dynamic and there's no quick fixes. Your recommendations? Yes, I think the, the minister needs to be commended in, in being quite candid in uh, when tabling his annual report for 2016-2017. He's listed a plethora of problems and challenges that need to be fixed. Uh, but what we need is we need stability and a systematic an approach, a systematic ap approach. And I hope that that's going to happen. Something that I do think is a cause for concern is the minister's uh, view that he wants to establish a direct relationship between the ministry and crime intelligence, because we know to what extent intelligence has been abused in South Africa and is currently apparently also being abused. So that uh, reform that he's proposing does concern me, and, and I hope that the minister can assuage me and, and probably other South Africans that uh, crime intelligence reporting directly to him will not lead to the politicization of crime intelligence, but rather bring stability in that most important unit. All right, we're going to have to repatch the minister. The, we're just having technological gremlins at the moment, but I hope uh, he is making notes uh, in terms of what we are concerned about as South Africans to enable us to sleep easier at night. Now the army being deployed. There was also the criticism of select intervention on the part of the minister which will pose to him that he's only reacting and this came from the MEC for safety and security in the Western Cape that the minister is only reacting because largely uh, black uh, predominantly black uh, areas are being affected by crime I mean is, is this a responsible uh, view or rather an utterance on your part Dr. Ndim I, I think it's just irresponsible uh, as I said that uh, the, the minister requests this deployment from the president and the president does not deploy the army until he's satisfied that the circumstances exist that are allowed by the act and the constitution and the parliament is there to check if that is the case therefore you cannot do that as you uh, as you please because it uh, favors you in this and that way it must be Authorized only because it is required by the situation. Mm. All right, we take a caller, Amolefe in Johannesburg. Good evening to you and thanks for calling. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity and I would like to say evening to everyone in the panel. Good evening. And, <clears throat> all right. Um, I just want to say, you know what, I'm happy with the decision by the minister and I'm saying, you know, congrats to such decision making, you know. Look, uh, I've got only two queries. One can be positive and one can be negative. All right. The only positive thing that I can pick up from this decision is the army has no relationship with the gangsters. It's very clear we here within the community we know that police are working with the criminals. So if you see there's no relationship, there's no favor to be done. You know, law will be enforced and it will be entrenched and will have a positive result. So there's no relationship at all. And then the other thing that I want to ask the minister is, I mean, at the end of the day, we have processes that are in for selling drugs, we have processes that are in for selling. What are you going to do after a critical combat of kind? What processes are going to be in place? Because when coming to stopping selling of drugs, it needs a process because it's a process. You know, it's not something that can be stopped by their army. 
The army can combat on that immediate time. Maybe take the drugs from the people who are holding, but it doesn't stop their process. Mm. What is his program and succession program in order to implement processes to stop drugs in South Africa? All right. Mulefe, thanks so much. And uh, in the interest of time and uh, because of the issues we have with technology, uh, Minister, just a couple of questions. Number one is uh, the issue of processes, monitoring, evaluation, and ensuring that the system will work. Uh, and the other one was also the separation of uh, the intelligence uh, reporting directly to you. Dr. Salia saying that, uh, that there is potential abuse or politicizing uh, the particular issue. No, I don't want intelligence to report to me. I'm the executive authority. So if you ask me in parliament that, Minister, are you in charge? And then I must be able to respond, I'm in charge because there is concurrence. I don't want intelligence to report to me. It doesn't report to me. It reports to the uh, generals that are there, but there is concurrence. And uh, to avoid what he fears about the question of abuse, uh, I'm, not the, I'm not the general of the crime intelligence or of the police. Uh, I'm the executive authority. I need to hold them accountable. So that when he complains that the very same intelligence is being abused, either for political ends or any other thing, I must be in the position to say that these are the measures that I've put in place to hold them accountable. Will there be monitoring and evaluation? Look, the deployment of the army will be utilized maximally and uh, at the same time directed to hotspots, and it will be deployed effectively, not among citizens. This is not apartheid style. It will be deployed where we've got challenges of violent crimes day and night, where there are guns and gun-toting criminals day and night who are dangerous. I'm talking about automatic rifles. And uh, we do have the capacity to deal with them, but it is ad hoc. So I want to wipe them out and to squeeze them. Those who are gun-toting to basically ensure that we put them in their place. At the present moment, I don't have uh, sufficient numbers on the ground to be in those dangerous places at all time. I'm actually depleted. So I need a force multiplier to bring this to control because I can't allow my people and our people to be terrorized by criminals without giving an answer to that. So all our forces will be on the ground to deal with this, but police will be in the forefront. Those who are dangerous, we meet them toe for toe with those who are trained in the field to deal with them, and that is the army. But the army will always be behind the lines. We will be in the front line. All right, another criticism, Western Cape MEC for Safety and Security, alleging that uh, this intervention of the South African National Defence Force is largely because the uh, predominantly black communities are now being uh, more affected with violent crime. Well, I don't know what he's talking about, Dan Plato, because uh, they are the first to talk about uh, the army. Now I'm addressing the question of the army, Minister Mbalula? Okay, yeah. Now is okay, they, they, there yes. you go. Uh, can you hear us? Yeah. Please finish your, your thoughts. Yeah. So, yes, I take that. Hmm. All right, we're going to have to leave it uh, or let the minister go. Figile Mbalula, Minister of Police, speaking to us on uh, him seeking uh, the assistance of the South African National Defence Force in uh, hotspots, in crime hotspots, saying that these are typically your more combative, uh, hugely armed uh, criminals and syndicates that he's going after. It's not an apartheid state, necessarily. Does it give you peace of mind, Dr. Salia, uh, in, in how we can turn the trajectory or turn <coughs> Or, you know, uh, the tipping point of, uh, of a crime in this country? Um, I think that um, certainly the minister has identified a number of challenges. Uh, I think the deployment of the SANDF may help in the short term, but I go back, unless we fix crime intelligence, and which, unless we bring stability to the police, um, place an emphasis on uh, detective work, fix our prosecution services, all of these are stopgap measures. Many of the problems that we face in policing in South Africa are self-inflicted. It's because of poor management and the parachuting in of politicians. Mm. 
All right, that's a uh, doctor. To run it. Yeah. These things need to be fixed, and that that can go a long way to turn it, to helping to turn uh, South Africa's uh, uh, crime challenges around. All right, let's get a view from a caller like he in Johannesburg. Good evening to you. Hello, how are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm okay, ma'am. I would like to firstly greet everyone in the panel. Um, I would like to greet Figilem Balula. Um, my comment that is that um, SANDF is a good idea, but it's temporary. So we need a, a permanent solution. Like if you can look nowadays where, where there's crime, these crimes are organized. So if I'm viewing very well, these people are trained and they don't really look the African. So you can find that they are from other countries and they are trained soldiers, you know, like child um, soldiers. So when they come here, they have organized crime and they are well ahead of our um, SAPF. So I'm saying to Figilem Balu, it's a good thing that he is doing, but we need a more permanent solution. So mm. I have a way or I have plans of how you can um, implement this, this thing, systematic approaches. So I, I really need to speak to him so we can see we'll go forth with this because these people are well ahead of the South African um, mm. police service. Right? Uh, so yeah. you, 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 I'm sure you can find him on Twitter, uh, Lucky, but uh, thanks so much for your call. And I don't necessarily want to you know, uh, labor the point of us being careful in labeling uh, foreign nationals who are living in the country. And I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll finish with you, Dr. Ndima, on you know, how we assess criminals are criminals and not necessarily to, to typecast and say it's a particular nationality. Just come again. No, no, I'm saying, you know, it's bordering on xenophobic mm -hmm. attacks or stereotypes that uh, uh, our last caller was saying and why we need to treat crime as uh, an offense to, to humanity as opposed to looking at individual nationalities. Mm. Mm. Yes, of course, crime is crime. You know, it doesn't help. To, to categorize as yes, yes, belonging to the foreigners and what. Yeah, wh what the Act, the Defense Act is saying, is that uh, um, they must actually be checking if those foreigners are legal uh, and are armed. That is their, their mandate, with, uh, which involves foreigners. Only those who are illegally in the country were not documented, and those who have got illegal weapons, those are the ones that are targeted. All right, Dr. Ndima, thanks so much for indulging us. <laughs> and joining us in studio, Dr. Dal Ndima, UNISA constitutional law expert, and Dr. Jackie Salia's Institute for Security Studies as the executive director. And we had on the line Minister of Police, Afigil Mbalula, and we do apologize for uh, the disruption in the connectivity. It has to do with the weather, and our technicians are on it. On